All right, welcome to another episode of Mike Reads, though I'm considering changing the name to Mike Bumbles Through. Um, tonight we're going to be continuing with our series on Adam Smith's The Wealth of Nations uh, with Chapter 8, The Wages of the Wages of Labor. So let's get right on into it. <clears throat> the produce of labor and co- the produce of labor constitutes the natural recompense or wages of labor in that original state of things which precedes both the appropriation of land and the accumulation of stock the whole produce of labor belongs to the laborer he has neither landlord nor master to share with him had this state continued the wages of labor would have augmented with all those improvements in its productive powers to which the division of labor gives occasion. All things, gra- all things would gradually have become cheaper. They would have been produced by a smaller quantity of labor, and as the commodities produced by equal quantities of labor would naturally in this state of things be exchanged for one another, they would have been purchased likewise with the produce of a smaller quantity. But though all things would have been but though all things would have become cheaper in reality, in appearance many things might have become dearer than before or have been exchanged for a greater quantity of other goods. <clears throat> Let us suppose, for example, that in the greater part of employments the productive powers of labor had been improved to tenfold or that a day's labor could produce ten times the quantity of work which it had done originally but that in a particular employment they had been improved only to double, or that a day's labor could produce only twice the quantity of work which it had done before. In exchanging the produce of a day's labor in the greater part of employments for that of a day's labor in this particular one, ten times the original quantity of work in them would purchase only twice the original quantity in it. Any particular quantity in it, therefore, a pound of weight, for example, would appear to be five times dearer than before. In reality, however, it would be twice as cheap. Though it required five times the quantity of other goods to purchase it, it would require only half the quantity of labor either to purchase or produce it. The acquisition, therefore, would be twice as easy as before. But this original state of things, in which the laborer enjoyed the whole produce of his own labor, could not last beyond the first introduction of the appropriation of land and the accumulation of stock. It was at an end, therefore, long before the most considerable improvements were made in the productive powers of labor, and it would be to no purpose to trace farther what might have been its effects upon the recompense or wages of labor. As soon as land becomes private property, the landlord demands a share of almost all the produce which the laborer can either raise or collect from it. His rent makes the first first deduction from the produce of the labor which is employed upon land. It seldom happens that the person who tills the ground has wherewithal to maintain himself till he reaps the harvest. His maintenance is generally advanced to him from the stock of a master, the farmer who employs him, and who would have to and would have no interest to employ him unless he was to share the produce of his labor or unless his stock was to be replaced to him with a profit this profit makes a second deduction from the produce of the labor which is employed upon land the produce of almost all other labor is liable to to the like deduction of profit in all arts and manufactures the great part of the greater part of the workmen stand in need of a master to advance them the materials of their labor and work. Oh, sorry, to advance them the materials of their work and their wages and maintenance till it be completed. He shares in the produce of their labor or in the value which it adds to the materials upon which it is bestowed and in this share consists his profit. It sometimes happens, indeed, that a single independent workman has stock sufficient both to purchase the materials of his work and to maintain himself till it be completed. He is both master and workman and enjoys the whole produce of his own labor, or the whole value which it adds to the materials upon which it is bestowed. It includes what are usually two distinct revenues belonging to two distinct persons, the profits of stock and the wages of labor. Such cases, however, are not very frequent, and in every part of Europe, twenty workmen serve under a master for one that is independent, and the wages of labor are everywhere understood to be, what they usually are, 
when the laborer is one person and the owner of the stock which employs him another. <clears throat> what are the common wages of labor depends everywhere upon the contract usually made between those two parties whose interests are by no means the same. The workman desires to get as much, the master dis to, to give as little as possible. The former are disposed to combine in order to raise, the latter in order to lower the wages of labor. It is not, however, difficult to, see, to foresee which of the two parties must, upon all ordinary occasions, have the advantage in the dispute, and force the other into compliance with their terms. The masters, being fewer in number, can combine much more easily, and the law, besides, authorizes or at least does not prohibit their combinations while it prohibits those of the workmen. We have no acts of Parliament against combining to lower the price of work, but many against combining, combining to raise it. In all such disputes, the master can hold out much longer. A landlord, a farmer, a master manufacturer, or merchant, though they did not employ a single workman, could generally live a year or two upon the stock which they have already acquired. Many workmen could not subsist a week, few could subsist a month, and scarce any a year without employment. In the long run, the workman may be as necessary to his master as his master is to him, but the necessity is not so immediate. We rarely hear, it has been said, of the combinations of masters, though frequently of those of workmen. But whoever imagines upon this account that masters really combine, is as ignorant of the world as of the subject. Masters are always and everywhere in this sort of tacit but constant and uniform combination, not to raise the wages of labor above their actual rate. To violate this combination is everywhere a most unpopular action, and a sort of reproach to a master among his neighbors and equals. We seldom, indeed, hear of this combination because it, is, because it is the usual, and one may say, the natural state of things which nobody ever hears of. <coughs> Masters, too, sometimes enter into particular combinations to sink the wages of labor even below this rate. These are always conducted with the utmost silence and secrecy, till the moment of execution, and when the workmen yield, as they sometimes do, without resistance, though severely felt by them, they are never heard of by other people. Such combinations, however, are frequently resisted by a contrary defensive combination of the workmen, who sometimes, too, without any provocation of this kind, combine of their own accord to raise the price of their labor. Their usual pretenses are, sometimes, the high price of provisions, sometimes the great profit which makes their masters buy their work. But, what, but whether their combinations be offensive or defensive, they are always abundantly heard of. In order to bring the point to a speedy decision, they have always recourse to, to the loudest clamor, and sometimes to the most shocking violence and outrage. They are desperate, and act with the folly and extravagance of desperate men, who must either starve or frighten their masters into an immediate compliance with their demands. The masters upon these occasions are just as clamorous upon the other side, and never cease to call aloud for the assistance of, civ of the civil magistrate, and the rig rigorous execution of those laws which have been en enacted with so much severity against the combinations of servants, laborers, and journeymen. The workmen, accordingly, very seldom derive any advantage from the violence of those tumultuous combinations, which, partly from this inter interposition of the civil magistrate, partly from the superior steadiness of their masters, partly from the necessity which the greater part of the workmen are under of submitting for the sake of, pr of present subsistence, generally end in nothing but the punishment or ruin of the ringleaders. <clears throat> But though in disputes with their workmen, masters must generally have the advantage, there is, however, a certain rate below which it seems impossible to reduce, for any considerable time, the ordinary wages even of the lowest species of labor. A man must always live by his work, and his wages must at least be sufficient to maintain him. They must even upon most occasions be somewhat more, otherwise it would be impossible for him to bring up a family, and the race of such workmen could not last beyond the first generation. Mr. Cantillon seems, upon this account, to suppose that the lowest species of common laborers must everywhere earn at least double their own maintenance in order that one, 
in order that one with another they may be enabled to bring up two children. The labor of the wife, on account of her necessary attendance to the children, being supposed no more than sufficient to provide for herself. But one half the children is born, it is computed, die before the age of manhood. The poorest laborers, therefore, according to this account, must, with one another, attempt to rear at least four children, in order that two may have an equal chance of living to that age. But the necessary maintenance of four children, it is supposed, may be nearly equal to that of one man. The labor of an able-bodied slave, the same author adds, is computed to be worth double his maintenance, and that of the meanest laborer, he thinks, cannot be worth less than that of the unable-bodied slave. <clears throat> Thus far, at least, seems certain that in order to bring up a family, the labor of the husband and wife together must, even in the lowest species of common labor, be able, labor, be able to earn something more than what is precisely necessary for their own maintenance, but in what proportion, whether the, in that above mentioned, or in any other, I shall not take upon me to determine. There are certain circumstances, however, which sometimes give the laborers an advantage, and enable them to raise their wages considerably above this rate, evidently the lowest which is consistent with common humanity. When in any country the demand for those who live by wages, laborers, journeymen, servants of every kind, is continually increasing, when every year furnishes employment for a greater number than had, than had been employed the year before, the workmen have no occasion to combine in order to raise their wages. The scarcity of hands occasions a competition among masters, who bid against one another in order to get workmen, and thus voluntarily break through the natural combination of masters not to raise wages. The demand, the demand for those who live by wages, it is evident, cannot increase but in proportion to the increase of the funds which are destined for the payment of wages. These funds are of two kinds. First, the revenue which is over and above what is necessary for the maintenance, and secondly, the stock which is over and above what is necessary for the employment of their masters. <clears throat> when the landlord, annuitant, or moneyed man has a greater revenue than what he judges sufficient to maintain his own family, he employs either the whole or a part of the surplus in maintaining one or more menial servants. Increase this surplus, and he will naturally increase the number of those servants. When an independent workman, such as a weaver or shoemaker, has got more stock than what is sufficient to purchase the materials of his own work, and to maintain himself he can dispose of t maintain himself till he can dispose of it he naturally employs one or more journeymen with the surplus in order to make a profit by their work increase this surplus and he will naturally increase the number of his journeymen <coughs> the demand for those who live by wages therefore necessarily increases with the increase of the revenue and stock of every country and cannot possibly increase without it the increase of revenue in stock is the increase of national wealth. The demand for those who live by wages, therefore, naturally increases with the increase of national wealth and cannot possibly increase without it. It is not the actual greatness of national wealth, but its continual increases, which occasions a rise in the wages of labor. It is not, accordingly, in the richest, of in the richest countries, but in the most thriving or in those which are growing rich the fastest, that the wages of labor are the highest. England is currently, in the present times, a much richer country than any part of North America. The wages of labor, however, are much higher in North America than in any part of England. In the province of New York, common laborers earn three shillings and sixpence currency, equal to two shillings sterling a day. Ship carpenters, ten shillings and sixpence currency, with a pint of rum worth sixpence sterling, equal in all to six shillings and sixpence sterling, House carpenters and bricklayers, eight shillings currency equal to four shillings and six pence sterling. Journeymen tailors, five shillings currency equal to about two shillings and ten pounds sterling. These prices are all above the London price, and wages are said to be as high in other colonies as in New York. The price of provisions is everywhere in North America much lower than in England. A dearth has never been known there. 
in the worst seasons, they have always had a suf- had sufficiency for themselves, the less for exportation. If the money price of labor, therefore, be higher than it is anywhere in the mother country, its real price, the real command of the necessaries and conveniencies of life which it conveys to the labor, must be higher in a still greater proportion. <coughs> But though North America is not yet so rich as England, it is much more thriving and advancing with much greater rapidity to the further acquisition of riches. The most decisive mark of the prosperity of any country is in the increase of the number of its inhabitants. In Great Britain, and most other European countries, they are not supposed to double in less than 500 years. In the British colonies in North America, it has been found that they double in 20 or 5 and 20 years. Nor in the present times is this increase principally owing to the continual importation of new inhabitants, but to the great multiplication of the species. Those who live to old age, it is said, frequently see there from, see there from fifty to a hundred, and sometimes many more, descendants from their own body. Labor is there so well rewarded that a numerous family of children, instead of being a burthen, is a source of opulence and prosperity to the parents. The labor of each child, before it can leave their house, is computed to be worth a hundred pounds clear gain to them. A young widow with four or five young children, who among the middling or inferior ranks of people in Europe, would have so little chance for a second husband, as there is there frequently courted as a sort of fortune. The value of children is is the greatest of all encouragements to marriage. We cannot, therefore, wonder what the people in North America should generally marry very young. Notwithstanding the great increase occasioned by such early marriages, there is a continual compliance of the scarcity of hands in North America. The, man, the demand for laborers, the funds destined for maintaining them, increase, it seems, still faster than they can find laborers to employ. Though the wealth of a country should be very great, Yet if it has been long stationary, we must not expect to find the wages of labor very high in it. The funds destined for payment of wages, the revenue and stock of its inhabitants, may be of the greatest extent, but if they have continued for several centuries of the same, or very nearly the same extent, the number of laborers employed every year could could easily supply, and even more than supply, the number wanted the following year. There, com- there could seldom be any scarcity of hands, nor could the masters be obliged to bid against one another in order to get them. The hands, on the contrary, would, in this case, naturally multiply beyond their employment. There would be a constant scarcity of employment, and the laborers would be obliged to bid against one another in order to get it. If in such a country the wages of labor had ever been more than sufficient to maintain the laborer, and to enable him to bring up a family, the competition of the laborers and the interest of the masters would soon reduce them to this lowest rate which is consistent with common humanity. China has been long one of the richest, that is, one of the most fertile, best cultivated, most industrious, and most populous countries in the world. It seems, however, to have long been to have been long stationary. Marco Polo, who visited, more than, who visited it more than 500 years ago, describes its cultivation, industry, and populousness almost in the same terms in which they are described by travelers in present times. It had perhaps even long before his time acquired that full complement of riches which the nature of its laws and institutions permits it to require, to acquire. The accounts of all travelers, inconsistent in many other respects, agree in the low wages of labor and the difficulty which a laborer finds in bringing up a family in China. If by digging the ground a whole day he can get what will purchase a small quantity of rice in the evening, he is contented. The condition of artificers is, if possible, still worse. Instead of waiting indolently in their workhouses for the calls of their customers, as in Europe, They are continually running about the streets with the tools of their respective trades, offering their service and, as it were, begging employment. The poverty of the lower ranks of people in China far surpasses that of the most beggarly nations in Europe. In the neighborhood of Canton, many hundred, it is commonly said, many thousand families 
have no habitation on the land, but live constantly in little fishing boats upon the rivers and canals. The subsistence which they find there is so scanty that they are, they are eager, eager to fish up the nastiest garbage thrown overboard from any European ship. Any carrion, the carcass of a dead dog or cat, for example, though half putrid and stinking, is as welcome to them as the most wholesome food to the people of other countries. Marriage is encouraged in China, but not by the profitableness of children, but by the liberty of destroying them. In all great towns, several, several are every night exposed in the street or drowned like puppies in the water. The performance of this horrid offense is even said to be the avowed business by which some people earn their subsistence. China, however, though it may perhaps stand still, does not seem to go backwards. Its towns are nowhere deserted by their inhabitants. The lands which had once been cultivated are nowhere neglected. The same or very nearly the same annual labor must therefore continue to be performed, and the funds destined for maintaining it must not, consequently, be, su be sensibly diminished. The lowest class of laborers, therefore, notwithstanding their scanty subsistence, must some way or another make shift to continue their race so far as to keep up their usual numbers. But it would be otherwise in a country where the funds destined for the maintenance of labor were sensibly decaying. Every year the demand for servants and laborers would, in all the different classes of employments, be less than it had been in the year before. Many who had been bred in these superior classes, not being able to find employment in their own business, would be glad to seek it in the lowest. The lowest class not being no, not only overstocked with its own workmen, but with the overflowings of all the other classes, the competition for employment would be so great in it as to reduce the wages of labor to the most miserable and scanty subsistence of, of labor. Many would not be able to find employment even upon these hard times, but would either starve or be driven to seek a subsistence either by begging or by the per perpetration of pre or by the perpetration perhaps of the greatest enormities. Want, famine, and mortality would immediately prevail in that class, and from thence extend themselves to all the superior classes till the number of inhabitants in the country was reduced to what could easily be maintained by the revenue and stock which remained in it, and which had escaped either the tyranny or calamity which had destroyed the rest. This perhaps is nearly the present state of Bengal, and of some other of the English settlements in the East Indies. In a fertile country which had, been bef which had before been much depopulated, where subsistence consequently should not be very difficult, and where, notwithstanding, three or four hundred thousand people die of hunger in one year, we may be assured that the funds destined for the maintenance of the laboring poor are fast decaying. The difference between the genius of the British Constitution which protects and governs North America and that of the mercantile company which, op which oppresses and, and dominions in the East Indies cannot perhaps be better illustrated than by the different state of those countries. The liberal reward of labor, therefore, as it is the necessary effect, so it is the natural symptom of increasing national wealth. The scanty maintenance of, laboring, of the laboring poor, on the other hand, is the natural symptom of that, of that things are at a standstill. The scanty maintenance of the laboring poor, on the other hand, is the natural symptom that things are at a stand, and they are starving conditions that they are going fast backwards. In Great Britain, the wages of labor seem, in the present times, to be evidently more than what is precisely necessary to enable the laborer to bring up a family. It will not be necessary to enter into any tedious or doubtful calculation of what may be the lowest sum upon which it is possible to do this. There are many plain symptoms that the wages of labor are nowhere in this country regulated by the lowest rate which is consistent with common humanity. <clears throat> First, in almost every part of Great Britain there is a distinction, even, the lowest, even in the lowest species of labor, between summer and winter wages. Summer wages are always highest, but on account of the extraordinary expense of fuel, the maintenance of a family is most expensive in winter. Wages, therefore, being highest when this expense is lowest, 
it seems evident that they are not regulated by what is necessary for this experience, but by the quantity and supposed value of their work. A laborer, it might be said, indeed, ought to save part of his summer wages in order to defray his winter expense, and that through the whole year they do not exceed what is necessary to maintain his family through the whole year. A slave, however, or one absolutely dependent on us for immediate subsistence, would not be treated in this manner. His daily subsistence would be, propor would be proportioned to his daily necessities. Secondly, the wages of labor do not in Great Britain fluctuate with the price of provisions. These vary everywhere from year to year, frequently from month to month. In many, but in many places, the money price of labor remains un uniformly the same, sometimes for half a century together. If in these places, therefore, the laboring poor can maintain their families in dear years, they must be at their ease in times of moderate plenty, and in affluence in th and in, and in affluence in those of extraordinary cheapness. The high price of provisions during these ten years past has not in many parts of the kingdom been accompanied with any sensible rise in the money price of labor. It has indeed, in some, owing probably more to the increase in the demand for labor than, that, than to that of the price of provisions. Thirdly, as the price of provisions varies from more from one year to from year to year than wages of labor, so, on the other hand, the wages of labor vary more from place to place than the price of provisions. The prices of bread and butcher's meat are generally the same or very nearly the same through the greater part of the United Kingdom. These and most other things which are sold by retail, the way in which the laboring poor buy all things, are generally fully as cheap or cheaper in great towns than in the remoter parts of the country, for reasons which I, have, which I shall have occasion to explain hereafter. But the wages of labor in a great town in its neighborhood are frequently in a fourth or a fifth part, 20, 20 or 5 and 20 percent, higher than at a few miles distance. 18 pence a day may be reckoned the common price of labor in London and its neighborhood, and if at a few miles distance it falls to 14 and 15 pence. 10 pence may be reckoned its price in Edinburgh and its neighborhood. <clears throat> at a few miles distance it falls to 8 pence, the usual price of common labor through the greater part of the low country of Scotland, where it varies a good deal less than in England. Such a difference in prices, which it seems is not always sufficient to transport a man from one parish to another, would necessarily occasion so great a transportation of the most bulky commodities not only from one parish to another, but from one end of the kingdom almost from one end of the world to the other, as would soon reduce them more, more nearly to a level, as would soon reduce them more nearly to a level. After all that has been said of, said of the levity and inconsistency of human nature, it appears evident, evidently from experience that a man is all, of all sorts of luggage the most difficult to be transported. If the laboring poor, therefore, can maintain their families in those parts of the kingdom where the price of labor is lowest, they must be in affluence where it is highest. Fourthly, the variations in the price of labor not only do not correspond either in place or time with, the, with those in the price of provisions, but they are frequently quite opposite. Grain, the food of the common people, is dearer in Scotland than in England, when Scotland receives almost every year very large supplies. But English corn must be sold dearer in Scotland, the country to which it is brought, than in England, the country from which it comes, and in proportion to its quality it cannot be sold dearer in Scotland than the Scotch corn that comes to the same market in competition with it. The quality of grain depends chiefly upon the quality of flour. Or the, sorry, the quality of grain depends chiefly upon the quantity of flour or meal which it yields at the mill, and this and in this respect, English grain is so much superior to the Scotch that, although often dearer in appearance or in proportion to the mash, measure of its bulk, it is generally cheaper in reality or in proportion to its quality, or even to the measure of its weight. The price of labor, on the contrary, is dearer in England than in Scotland. 
If the laboring poor, therefore, can maintain their families in the one part of the United Kingdom, they must be in affluence in the other. <clears throat> Oatmeal indeed supplies the common people in Scotland with the greatest and best parts of their food, which is in general much inferior to that of their neighbors of the same rank in England. This difference, however, in the mode of their subsistence is not the cause, but the effect of the difference in their wages, though by a strange misapprehension I have frequently heard it represented as the cause. It is not because one man keeps a coach while his neighbor walks afoot that the one is rich and the other poor, but because the one is rich he keeps a coach, and because the other is poor he walks afoot. During the course of the last century, taking one year with another, grain was dearer in both parts of the United Kingdom than during that of the present. This is a matter of fact which cannot now admit of any reasonable doubt, and the proof of it is, if possible, still more decisive with regard to Scotland than with regard to England. It is in Scotland supported by the evidence of the public of fires, annual violation, valuations made upon oath, according to the actual state of the markets of all the different sorts of grain in every different county of Scotland. <clears throat> if such direct proof could require any collateral evidence to confirm it, I would observe that this has likewise been the case in France, and probably in most parts of other parts of Europe. With regard to France, there is the clearest proof. But though it is certain that in both parts of the United Kingdom grain was somewhat dearer in the last century than in the present, it is equally certain that, the, that labor was much cheaper. If the laboring poor, therefore, could bring up their families then, they must be much more at their ease now. In the last century, the most usual day wages of common labor through the greater part of Scotland were six pence in summer and five pence in winter. Three shillings a week, the same price very nearly, still continues to be paid in some parts of the Highlands and Western Islands. Though the greater part of the low country, the, through the greater part of the low country, the most usual wages of common labor are now eight pence a day, ten pence, sometimes a shilling about in Edinburgh, in the counties which border upon England, probably on account of that neighborhood, and in a few other places where there has lately been a considerable rise in the demand for labor, about Glasgow, Carron, Ayrshire, etc. In England, the improvements of agriculture, manufactures, and commerce began much earlier than in Scotland. <clears throat> the demand for labor and consequently its price, must necessarily, must necessarily have increased with those improvements. In the last century, accordingly, as well as in the present, the wages of labor were higher in England than in Scotland. They have risen, too, considerably since that time, though on account of the greater var variety of wages paid there in different places, it is much more difficult to ascertain how much. In 1614, the pay of a foot soldier was the same as in the present times, eight pence a day. When it was first established, it would naturally be regulated by the usual wages of common laborers, the rank of people from which foot soldiers are commonly drawn. Lord Chief Justice Hales, who wrote in the time of Charles II, computes the necessary expense of a laborer's family, consisting of six persons, the father, of, father and mother, two children able to do something, and two not able, at ten shillings a week, or twenty-six pounds a year. If they cannot earn this by their labor, they must make it up, he supposes, either by begging or stealing. He appears to have inquired very carefully into this subject. In 1688, Mr. Gregory King, whose skill in political arithmetic is so much extolled by Dr. Davenant, computed the ordinary income of laborers and outservants to be 15 pounds a year to a family, which he supposed to consist, one with another, of three and a half persons. His calculation, therefore, though different in appearance, corresponds very nearly at, the bot at bottom with that of Judge Hales. <clears throat> but suppose the weekly expense of such families to be about 20 pence a head. Both the pecuniary income and expense of such families have increased considerably since that time through the greater portion of the kingdom. In some places more, and in some, some less, though perhaps scarce anywhere so much as some exaggerated accounts of the present wages of labor have lately represented them to the public. 
the price of labor, it must be observed, cannot be ascertained very accurately anywhere, different prices being often paid at the same place and for the same sort of labor, not only according to the different abilities of the workmen, but according to the easiness or hardiness of their masters. Where wages are not regulated by law, all that we can pretend to determine is what are the most usual, and the experience seems to show that the, that law can never regulate them properly, though it is often pretended to do so. All right, we're going to take just a little bit of a break here. Actually, we're up over a half hour here, and I'm trying to limit these to half hour sessions, and this, this chapter seems to have another 10 or so pages left to it at least. Um, yeah, this chapter's got another 20 or so pages to it. So we're going to go ahead and stop there. We're about halfway through chapter 8, the wages of labor, or of the wages of labor. <clears throat> and uh, since he's going through all these numbers and using abbreviations I've never seen and punctuations I've never seen for these abbreviations uh, in sense, I am really struggling with <laughs> the actual reading tonight. Um, so thanks for sticking with me. <laughs> thanks for struggling through with it with me. We will see you tomorrow night um, with the second half of Chapter 8 of The Wages of Labor. So until then, it's been Mike signing off.